you riding down the road in your car. Welcome. It's midday moments. It is the week leading up to Christmas. Come, let us adore him. Bow down and worship him. Come, come. It's midday moment. Come, come. Let us. Kneel down before him. In your presence. Worship and adore him. Emmanuel. Come on in. Midday moments. It's midday moments here at Second Baptist. I welcome you. I invite you. Welcome to our midday moment. This is the week, the Wednesday leading up to Christmas. First and foremost, I pray that you will have a wonderful, warm, merry, and blessed Christmas. I want to take a moment now and invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God, our Father, how we thank you afresh for your grace and for your mercy. And we thank you that things are as well as they are. Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise for being the awesome, available, and the accessible God that you are. Thank you for our time together, even right now. Whatever time someone may see this, I pray that it will speak to their hearts as well as speak to their minds. Thank you, God, for life, health, and strength, and thank you for just being the God that you are. We'll be forever grateful to give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome. This is my midday moment for this week leading up to Christmas. And today I want to anchor my thoughts on this idea, Christ, our Christmas hope. The context of what I want to say comes out of Luke chapter 25, Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 25 through 35. Let me read those verses. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he could not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms, praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Christ our Christmas hope. In 1965, naval aviator James Stockdale became the first American pilot to be shot down in the Vietnam War. As a prisoner of the Viet Cong, he spent seven years as a POW 
during which he was frequently tortured and frequently tried and frequently encouraged to denounce the war and to denounce what the United States were doing. But Stockdale did not do it. He was chained for days at a time with his hands above his head. So he couldn't even swat the mosquitoes that was in his camp. From 1972, which was his release, until 205, which is when he died, he could hardly bend his knees. And he, when he walked, he walked with a severe limp from having his legs broken by his captors and never reset. One of the worst things done to him, he said, was that he was held in isolation away from all the other American POWs and was only allowed to see his guard or the person that was his interrogator. So when he was released, one news reporter asked him, how could anyone survive that kind of treatment? How could anyone lived through that kind of treatment for seven years. Stockdale said that when he looked back over that time, he had a lot of time to think about how he made it. And the only thing he said that he could think about or understand or believe that the reason he made it for seven years in that situation isolated, in pain, interrogated, beaten, very little medical attention. The only reason he survived, he said, because he never gave up hope. He said he believed for sure that hope was the only thing that kept him alive. He said he, he hoped that maybe this is the day that the U.S. soldiers will find this camp. And if they do, they will free all of us. Or he says when he was not hoping that the U.S. soldiers would find the camp and free them, he would hope that maybe this is the day that I find a way to escape this place. He said, but it didn't make any difference. His whole reason, he believed, for surviving was that he just did not give up on hope. Because he knew, he said, that if he gave up hope, he probably would have died. That is the power of hope. That it can keep one alive when nothing else can. And so therefore, I want to encourage anyone never to give up hope. Because your miracle, your deliverance, your breakthrough just may be around the corner. Your delivery, your breakthrough, your rescue may be en route to where you are. And therefore, you have to decide that regardless of how hopeless a situation may be. The hopelessness of the situation does not make you the individual hopeless. The hopeless of something that may be at its end just may be the place of new beginning for you. I know, I know that it's sometimes easier said than it is actually to embrace, but sometimes the hopelessness of something that may be at its very end may just well be the very beginning of something new and fresh for you. This story in Luke 2 gives us a picture of a person and a precept about hope. That is all Simeon had. It was hope that was keeping Simeon alive. Hope was the focus 
and the faith of his existence. His name, Simeon, literally means God has heard. It comes from the name that Leah gave to that child born to her. She was hated or disliked by Rachel. And when Simeon is born, she said, I'm going to name him Simeon, which means God has heard my prayer. That's, that's a concept, that's an attribute or a hallmark of who Simeon was. He was a man that apparently God had heard his prayer. Our Christmas hope is not something that we can find under a tree. And it's not something that you can put in a box or put a bow on. It's not something that you can put a price on it. Because our hope is too big to be put in a box. Or our hope is too big to be on a tree. Or our hope is so priceless you could not put a price on it. Our Christmas hope is not something that is wrapped in a box. It is not something that has a bow on it. It is not something that one can so easily purchase. Our hope is Jesus Christ. That's our hope. Now, two or three things I want to say to you about our Christmas hope that comes out of the life of Simeon. Number one, Simeon was expecting the presence of the Savior. Verse 25 says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. I want to remind you that it's so important when you are a child of God that whatever you do, do not lose your sense of expecting the presence of the Savior. I'm sure uh, you can recall when you were a little child of how you were expecting something on Christmas Day. I think about it as a child myself. I went to bed at night not knowing what was going to be there, but I was expecting something. I saw that in my own child. She didn't go to bed at night knowing what would be under that tree, but she was expecting something. I see that in my grandchild. She did not know what her granddad, what her family is going to give her, but she's expecting something. Because that's the spirit of Christmas, but it's also the spirit of a Christian that we are always in a season of expectancy. We are expecting to encounter the Messiah. I think that part of being a Christian is that when we come on Sunday morning, we ought to come to worship expecting to encounter the Christ. Our hope ought to be a hope that yearns, that expects the presence of the Messiah. You want to feel this presence. You want to, you, you, you want more, in my opinion, when you are a mature Christian, you want more than packages and presents. You want the presence of Christ. Gifts are wonderful. Gifts are great. But to have the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ, is the greatest present. So the first thing I want to Suggest to you that your hope and my hope ought to be a hope that is expecting the presence of a Savior. Verse 25 says that Simeon was waiting, expecting the consolation of Israel. There was something in Simeon that he was yearning to encounter the Messiah. What are you yearning for? What are you really yearning for on the inside? Simeon wasn't just expecting the presence of the Savior. Simeon was encouraged by the promises of the scriptures. Verse 29 through 32, you read that. When Simeon says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised. You see, apparently... God had promised him that he would not die, but also Simeon was a devout man. He knew the scriptures, and I am convinced that Simeon was encouraged by the promises of the scriptures, by the promises that a Messiah would come. 
He was a devout man, a man of God, keenly aware of the promises of God. One of the great enemies of hope is that the enemies of hope wants you and I to forget about the promises of God. Don't you allow the predicaments, the problems, and the peculiarities of life cause you to forget the promises. God is still God. Simeon was encouraged by the promises of the scripture. When God promised something, God is not saying, I will try. God is saying, I'm, I can and I will. God's promises are, like, promises are like the stars. The darker the night, the brighter the promises. There is no delete button on God's computer. He never had to change his words or revise his opinion or edit his command. His words are settled. Our Christmas hope is that Simeon, like Simeon, he was expecting the presence of the Savior. Our Christmas hope is we are encouraged by the promises of the, promises of the Scripture. Last but not least, Simeon was an example of living a prayerful life in the Spirit. Simeon was an example of living prayerfully in the Spirit. He was looking for that presence. He was leaning on that, that promise. Simeon was moved by the Spirit. That's what verse 27 says. He was moved by the Spirit and he went into the temple courts and the Holy Spirit was upon him. But I promise you, he was prayerful every day about what God and where God wanted him to be. He's constantly coming to the temple. He appears to the temple as a daily worshiper. He understands as a believer he has to be daily faithful. <laughs> Simeon's life is a life of hope. His hope was an example of living prayerfully on the Spirit. And his hope, without a doubt, was that he was encouraged by the promises of the Scripture. And his hope was he was expecting the presence of the Savior. You know, that's your hope, or that should be your hope. I know that's my hope. I am expecting on Christmas Day, to have my moment where I, I sense the presence of the Christ who was born in Bethlehem. I, I will have that moment as a child of God, as a pastor and a preacher, where I reflect and believe and proclaim and affirm, yes, I do believe he was born in Bethlehem, and I'm sure he's born within me. I want you to have an expectancy of the presence of the Savior. And I want you to also be encouraged by the promises of the Scriptures. And I certainly want you to be an example of prayerfully living and trusting the Spirit of God. What's your hope this Christmas? Where is your hope this Christmas? I pray your hope is in the Christ Jesus, who is Lord and Savior. I pray that. I pray that you would have the true Christmas hope, which is expecting the presence of the Savior, which is encouraged by the promises of the Scripture, and which is an example of living prayerfully. Again, I pray you have a wonderful and a blessed Christmas. And I pray that the grace and the favor of God will be with you. We worship you. I make up with praises for what? Blessings come to you. What's your Christmas hope? Our Christmas hope is expecting the presence of the Savior, encouraged by the promises of the Savior, an example of the promise. You got to know how to give us a sacrifice of grace.
God bless you. God be with you until we meet again.